Hi, welcome to the webinar with Glenn Grossman. I'm Rebecca Berman. Honored to be the moderator tonight. Welcome to our guests live and those watching on YouTube. As many know, Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn mm -hmm. served as an epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and at UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology forecasting and advanced analytics with Bristol-Myers Squibb, Sanofi, Novartis, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, the CDC, and other programs within the United States and abroad. All views expressed today are his own. Glenn, take us around the country and around the world. How are things looking? Thanks, Rebecca. Welcome back. All right, so here, I'll start with this view. So this is uh, New York Times that we're looking at here. Um, as you can see, we've uh, had this surge of the Delta variant that started to hit around July um, around the country in different places. And now it looks like it's going down, uh, which is great news. There was a lot of uncertainty about whether it would uh, continue to go up and peak at the end of October. It does look like it's going down, but there's more to this story. And so we'll, we'll have to get into this a little bit more, uh, which I will in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> um, before I go on, I'll, I'll say, so this is also being reflected uh, in hospitalizations are going down and deaths are starting to go down as well. Although the death rate right now uh, is still quite high uh, in terms of the deaths per day we're still seeing uh, almost 2,000 people dying every single day uh, from uh, COVID-19. So this is still a thing. Um, this is the daily average on, on October 19th, uh, October 9th, so which was yesterday. Uh, so 1,750 deaths. So, so this is still a, a, a major issue that we're dealing with. That we're not out of the woods, but we're going in a great direction. <clears throat> um, here's where the heat map looks around the country currently. You'll notice that earlier, uh, back in July, it was mostly hitting the southern states. And so we saw it in Florida, we saw it in Texas, we saw it in Tennessee, and a, a lot of these southern country, uh, states over here. And now it's kind of shifted up into the north, into the, into the north, uh, both the northwest and it's starting to hit the northeast a little higher. Um, and so there's some interesting things to tease apart here. First, we saw this issue where um, some states might seem like they're getting hit hard, but then even within those states, there's some counties that are doing okay. And then similarly, there's some states where it's mostly okay, but then there's some counties within those states that are getting hit pretty hard. And so it's uh, better to look at this stuff on a, on a county level. But um, like you look at Alaska, that, that's uh, pretty consistently across the board with a, a couple of exceptions that they're not doing so well. Um, <clears throat> but so the big question now is as we're having these seasonal changes uh, in the North, will we sort of see um, the, the impacts like we see in the, the regular seasonal flu and, and other, other coronaviruses. Uh, so we've talked previously, let me see if I can pull this out real quickly. <clears throat> um, where would, here it is. So previously, um, when you look at the flu, we don't know exactly what causes seasonality of the flu. I think that there's multiple hypotheses that, that seem really compelling. But there's one interesting thing I wanted to point out here, and that's that when you look at kids getting uh, the flu versus adults, the kids always seem to start preceding the flu epidemic uh, curves by a few weeks before the adults do. And so in some ways, it's really easy to interpret this as kids sort of driving the flu season every year when they go back to school. <clears throat> and so the question has been, um, will the kids going back to school really drive a reemergence of this of this uh, uh, surge and we'll, we'll keep it going longer or will it uh, drive it again? And so we'll talk about this a little bit longer, but um, but right now let me drive into to it a little bit in terms of what the kids are looking like around the country. So this is a little hard to see. I'm gonna to, to jump into it a little bit closer. But first, so the uh, easy way to look at this, whoops, let me come up. An easy way to look at this is by regions. So the CDC, <clears throat> pardon me, has broken up the US 
into 10 different regions. So you can see New England is one, New Jersey, New York is two. I think Puerto Rico is also included under two, um, but it's essentially prim primarily New Jersey, New York. <clears throat> um, three is uh, Mid-Atlantic, four is the Southern, uh, uh, all these states down here. You can, and so you can see where, where they are. Originally, four and six were the ones that were spiking a lot. So you can see early on that in four, and six were the ones that were starting to spike, but those have since started coming down. So when we look at four here, four has, has spiked in the kids. These, and again, these are, so these are kids. The dotted lines at the bottom are the zero, age zero to four. The um, middle ones are this dashed lines are age five to 11. <clears throat> and the solid lines are 12 to 17. And so it's interesting and that um, when you, I'll, I'll dig into a, an example. So we'll go, I can go look at region two in a second. But when, but what's interesting is that earlier on, we didn't see a huge percentage um, of the cases among the kids. It was for, for a variety of reasons. Kids weren't going to school, they were staying home. So mostly rose and fall in the same pattern as, as the general community relative to the age groups. But now, there's a couple of things going on. First, a lot of these kids are not vaccinated. So particularly uh, right now, only kids above age 12 are even eligible to be vaccinated. Um, but because a lot of kids are not vaccinated, it makes sense that there'll be a higher proportion of people getting infected simply because they're not vaccinated. But in addition to that, we are seeing some spikes. So for instance, in the North, let's focus on region one and two. Again, this was New England and New Jersey, New York. <clears throat> which is now beginning its fall season. The weather's starting to change. The leaves are changing. Season is changing. And what we're seeing here in region one and two are that we are, are seeing a surge here now among the kids. So for instance, don't, don't pay too much attention to anything in the gray bar because the data is not typically fully reported yet. So the stuff in the gray bar tend, will tend to be higher uh, as when it makes it into the white. However, for something like this, once it's cleared the gray, this gray area, once it starts coming down, then this data is probably pretty accurate. And so this is probably a real decrease. However, what we're looking at here, we see a, a real increase that we're seeing. So the surge that we saw earlier <clears throat> is um, in, the, in the South, now we're seeing in kids in the Northeast. And so, but the interesting thing is, so we are seeing this surge here in, in region one and region two. We're also seeing it uh, in region 10, which is uh, the Northwest. Um, and then perhaps in some of these other areas like region eight, it looks like it could be surging a little bit. Um, it's a little bit unclear, it looks like it's going down but it might be sort of like hovering at some high levels. It's a little bit unclear right now because a lot of it's still in the gray bar. But, um, but at least we can see region one, region two and region 10 uh, so again, the Northeast and Northwest, if we come here, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that, so Montana is getting hit hard, but Montana is not in region 10, Montana is region eight. And so region 10, whoops, region 10 includes Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And so when you look here, so Oregon's being hit a little bit, Washington as well. So they're, they're being hit some, but when you look here, let me, here's a better one. When you look, it's, it's as a whole, it's really these states over here that are getting hit the hardest. This Northwest, these three, these three states over here don't seem to be as hit hard as, as these, as region eight. I think this was region eight. <clears throat> Yet the kids are, uh, are starting to spike high, although they're, they're, they, they were spiking a little high. So the question is gonna be, is this more reflecting just general prevalence of the disease or is this going to be like this graph I just showed you where it's going to trigger new outbreaks because the kids will go home and even if their parents are vaccinated, there'll be some likelihood of getting infected and spreading the virus. Um, that for me, the most curious thing is that when you look at region one and region two, again, this is New England and New York and New Jersey, these are clearly spiking, particularly among the, the five to 11 year old but I mean, also among the, the, um, the 12 to, to, to 17 year olds, uh, just not to the same extent. When you look at that and then look over here and or at this one, you don't see anything 
uh, to the extent that we saw the previous surges or, or what are the current high prevalence rates in some of these states. Um, so if like Massachusetts looks like it's doing pretty well, New Jersey looks like it's doing pretty well, and yet we're seeing the surge in the kids. So I, I think that we need to be open to this idea that the surge that we're seeing um, could go either way. Like, so even though it seems like it's going way down, we, we are right on the cusp of the seasonality. And if you recall, we had a similar type of thing last summer where we had the surge in the summer. Then as we moved toward the end of September, October, we started in early October is when we first started going back up again. And that's what caused this, this new surge. No one believes that we're gonna have a surge anywhere like what we saw last winter, um, just because at this point, so many people have been infected. <clears throat> but this surge that we're currently having, uh, that we're currently in, won't necessarily continue to go down. It, it may, uh, there's so much uncertainty here, but it could continue to, if the kids going back to school create these new surges, then it, then it could start spreading in the community again and start going up a little bit. So there's, that's something, that we're gonna be looking at. It's just an area of uncertainty. <clears throat> the issue is that the, what, what could help to change that is uh, these, these lockdowns. And so for instance, just real quickly, uh, we can talk about this a little later. It's a little hard to see this graph, but um, these are the schools that were closed um, from August to early September or the dark blue. Some schools are, uh, opened earlier than others since so they, they, they ended up shutting down earlier because of COVID outbreaks. And then these are schools, the light blue, that uh, reported closing uh, between September 13th, September 17th. So you, you can see that some states had a lot of closures. And when a school closes, then that's an immediate way to stop the outbreak in that school. And so depending on how quick these schools close, if they need to, how long they shut down, uh, that could have a huge impact on what the next few months look like in terms of school spreading, spreading it. Because right now, a large, a fairly large percentage of people who are unvaccinated are, are school age kids um, until, until the approvals. We'll talk a little bit, not, not a lot about that because we talked about it the last time we met, but um, it's likely right now that we're on track for the kid approvals. Uh, so up from uh, age five to, to 11 to be approved by uh, Halloween timeframe, uh, if all goes well. well. We can talk about that uh, schedule a little bit later. Um, and so, so that's where we are with kids. That's the, that's the open question there. Um, around the world, let me see if there's anything else first I want to talk about here. <clears throat> yeah, the kid, the kid issue is the biggest one that, that, that I've been following. Um, even among states, you can see that some states that were big in the surge have started to go down. Like so Florida, Louisiana were big and they've started to go down. Tennessee spiked a little later, they've started to go down. But now you're also seeing North Dakota, Montana, some of these others that are increasing. And so the question is how much of this is a seasonal thing where we're just about to start seeing it because the seasons have just started changing and how much is not. And, and we, don't, we don't have any good way to really look at this. The models are all over the place. Um, and so for me, it is a, definitely a plausible idea that, that we, could, we could see the surge happen again uh, as, as these kids uh, start to drive new, uh, new outbreaks. Um, all right, let me just look at the glo at the map uh, globally. So we've looked at at the uh, at the SARS-CoV-2 virus as a seasonal thing before. We've talked about this over time. So when you look back in July, June, it was mostly taking place in the southern hemisphere. Um, Australia had a lot of lockdowns, and so you don't so ignore Australia because their policies were very very rigid. Um, but when you look at it, when you compare it for last year, so back in, in our winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, here's January, you can see that it was mostly in the Northern Hemisphere where you're looking at things. Then as we hit the summer, it go, went back, our, our summer in the Northern Hemisphere was the winter in the, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, or rather our winter in the Northern Hemisphere was the summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you can see that the colors changed and now it's changing back. And, as, and so we're going back into the fall. And so the colors are now shifting back up. Uh, to the northern hemisphere, um, so you can see UK, other other countries are starting to get hit again. Um, all right, what does this look like? So some of these countries, Brazil, they've had so they've been hit so much so long. In fact, let's look at the um, cumulative. So here's Brazil. Brazil has not been counting their um, their cases very well. So comparing it to other countries, 
isn't really helping us here. But what they, but when you look here at the at the shape of the curve um, for Brazil, you can see that it's it hasn't really followed as strong a seasonal impact as you might imagine, just because it's been really gone wild for much of the country for for much of the of the last year and a half two years. But it looks like it's starting to settle down, um, and so this is this is pretty good news um, for for Brazil. And it looks like it's representative in, in much of the other um, South American countries as well. Um, when you look at United Kingdom, United Kingdom is odd because they had really strong vaccination rates. And so they were hoping that they could then reopen and eliminate all of their mandates and everything. Um, but then look what happened. Their caseload is still quite high. Um, it's even higher than the United States. What's interesting though, is despite this high caseload, when you look at, um, let me clean this up first. First, there's, this is all over the place. Australia, Brazil, France, Chile, South Africa, um, India, and Ni Nigeria are all going in a good direction. So I'm gonna um, clear them for now, just to clean it up a little bit. Um, Canada, it's uh, Canada's, it's it's going through a surge, but it's not nearly as high as the United States or some of these other countries relative to the population. Um, so let me just clear out some of these others. All right, um, India, Nigeria, and South Africa, I'll get rid of it. All right, so now the three that, I'll, that I'll, we can just look at are United Kingdom, Singapore, and United States. So here's UK, when you look, so these are cases, when you look at deaths, you see that UK has quite a lot lower deaths than the United States. So even though there's a, this continuing outbreak, the severity is not nearly as, as, as bad. The United States, where our vaccination rate is much lower. Uh, in fact, let me look at the vaccination rate. <clears throat> you can see what a big difference this makes, just of this uh, going from, in the United States, we have approximately 55% uh, vaccinated. UK, it's 60, what is this, 66 or so, 60, yes, 66%. Um, that, that makes that, that, 11% uh, is enough to give us these uh, these differences. See, when you look at the uh, number of deaths here versus the number of, of cases, you can see that um, that the United Kingdom is is doing far far better. And and again, the 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 va the vaccines are decent at protecting from infection. They're okay. They're not amazing. They're they're they're. I mean, they're they're good at protecting from infection but they still are amazing at protecting from hospitalization and, and, and death. So that, and ultimately when we talk about vaccines, that's the most important part. If a vaccine still, you might get sick if you get infected, but it reduces it to like a cold, a mild cold or, or asymptomatic, then who, I mean, it's, it's not quite so important. The biggest worry then is that you could infect someone else. But um, so, so the vaccine still, uh, people can still get infected to a, de to a degree, um, but, um, but they're very effective at preventing severe disease. All right, let me, so let me switch over to Singapore now. So here's UK, here's United States with, with, that we've talked about. What was interesting about Singapore <clears throat> was that Singapore, so I just, you might've noticed when I put this here, had a very high vaccination rate. They were much higher even than, than the United Kingdom was uh, at 77% here. And yet, despite this high vaccination rate, this this was the goal, and this was among all eligible people, um, so not including kids and whatever. But this was the goal. They, the, the idea has been that once you get everyone vaccinated, you could possibly get vaccinated, which was as uh, pretty. Singapore got as close to there as you could as you could probably get. Um, once you got to that goal, then the COVID epidemic should be over. Like we should open up everything, get rid of all mandates, and that's the end of the epidemic. The problem was that's what they did. And then they started getting a surge of cases after all the people were vaccinated. And so, the, the, so then the question is, so now they started closing down and they don't know what to do because what does this mean for the end? How do we, what, how, what will the end of COVID look like? Um, and so, um, so what we've done uh, with Singapore, you can still see is this infections. However, when you look at the death rate, so compared to the United States, Singapore has a lot more, I mean, not a lot more cases, but more cases than the United States. Um, and their surge is still going up. But when you look at the death rate, 
you can see that they have tremendously less deaths than the United States. And so in reality, the vaccines are working amazingly well, but they're not eliminating the risk of, of death. And so as a result, um, I think that we're going to need to open up. I mean, what, what are we talking about here in terms of absolute numbers? So uh, in terms of absolute numbers, there have been, uh, I don't know what this, how to interpret this. Oh, these are daily deaths. Let's, let's look at cumulative. Uh, so in Singapore, we're talking about 113 deaths. So, so don't let the surge confuse you too much because Singapore is a very small country. Uh, it, that compares to, to the over 700,000 reported deaths in the United States. But um, what's interesting about Singapore is, is whether it's a canary in the bird mine or rather a canary in the, in the, in the coal mine. Uh, my brain is a little tired, long weekend. Um, and so, and so, but, but so basically, it, I think I see this as confirmatory that this is good, for, that this is good news because we will, um, whoops, I want relative, because uh, the vaccines are working. And so that that's ultimately what we were, what, what the biggest uh, question was. Um, Glenn, I'm going to jump in right there because that's the big question. So many people are asking, how long do these vaccines work? And when should I get a booster shot? How long does the booster shot work? So that is like the million dollar question. Yeah, here, give me one second. Uh... All right, so oh, let's look at this, okay. So what I just mentioned, let me just uh, reiterate this. So, what, so there's two axes here. So it's a little bit hard, confusing to interpret. So let me just go through it real quickly. Is that when you look at the um, at the vaccine? So for not talking about the booster, just the second shot. Um, people who got it earlier um, versus people who got it later. Um, so the vaccine efficacy essentially goes down. Uh, so wait, which is, what are we looking at this? Oh, so basically the way to interpret this is that the efficacy against infection goes down the longer, um, the longer it, uh, away from the vaccine it is. However, efficacy, so that's, that's horizontal along the horizontal, uh, axis. As we get further and further away from the second dose, then we're more and more likely to get infected. So whereas we, we started maybe with the, particularly the mRNA vaccines, gave us maybe 90% protection against infection. As months go on, it drops and now it's maybe closer to 80% uh, for, for the population average. However, in contrast, when you look at efficacy against severe disease, it hasn't dropped very much at all. And again, this is the most important thing here because if the vaccines continue to be really strong at protecting people from going to the hospital and from dying, then yeah, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's still strong. Let me let me show you this one graph. And so this is a really important thing because when, when we talk about the booster, I think people are thinking about it as sort of boosting back to where we were with the second dose. And in fact, that's not what's going on at all. So let me show you the graph. Let's start with the 65 to 85 year olds. So one month, one month after the second dose, this was the, the level of antibodies in the blood. And so essentially, uh, that on average, this was the, the, uh, the amount of antibodies in the blood. However, one month after the third dose, this is the amount of antibodies in the blood. So it's not like the booster shot brought it back up to the second dose level. It actually almost doubled it past the second dose level. So in a way, it should almost be thought of as a, as a three series vaccine. We, we were thinking about it as a two series vaccine, but if you think about it as a three series vaccine, then it's even a more efficacious uh, vaccine. The same thing holds for people 18 to 55. You can see that it's, it brings up the total, for, for, the, for that age group there, we had higher antibodies <clears throat> after the second dose than, most, than a lot of people who are older did. However, at the third dose, we have roughly the same amount of antibodies. So we're reaching this sort of peak level of antibodies after uh, among people who get the booster shot and uh, get, or get this third dose. So this, is, so this is a good way of looking at it. In terms of how long it lasts, 
Um, let's talk about the, an Israel study that was just published and that could bring it. Um, Glenn, just a quick question <laughs> about this boost in the, the, from the booster shot. Do you have any other information regarding the, the different types of booster shots? And thank you, Dr. Chankowski, for your great question. Um, do we have any other, if so far only Pfizer has been approved, correct? Do we That's know right. any, anything else oh. about any, about the others? The short answer is no, but what we do have is a timeline. So uh, the FDA's uh, committee, this is the VRB PAC, that looks at the, um, at the that evaluates the um, uh, all these drugs and vaccines to, for, for approval or, or emergency use authorization. Um, they are going to be looking at it this week at the Moderna booster on October 15th. And so we talked previously about the process. I'll, I'll see if I can pull it out real quickly. What does the process look like? So typically it goes through the real world uh, data, the clinical trials. Um, then it goes through the VRB PAC. Then it goes to the, after they'd make their decision and the FDA look, takes a look and, and decides what they wanna do. Then from that, it goes to the advisory committee on uh, immunization practices. Then the CDC usually rubber stamps it. Uh, although we saw that they did not for the booster shot, they, uh, the, uh, let me see if I have a picture here. <clears throat> no, I don't. But anyway, for the booster shot, originally the uh, BRB pack wanted it for a broader group. Then the ACIP reduced it but then the CDC broadened it again uh, and, and, and was uh, consistent with the VRB pack. Uh, and then it goes out to the public. So we have this whole process. This is just the very first step in the process that we're looking at for Moderna, for Moderna which is going to be, um, like I said, on October 15th. Was that this one though? That's not, um, boom, boom, boom. That was over here. All right, and October 16th, the J&J booster, is going to be evaluated, and then also they're also uh, they're going to look at the question of mixing and matching vaccines. Um, so it's a question of if you got one uh, dose of the J and J, or you got the first and second dose of Moderna or Pfizer, could you switch and get the booster of a different brand? And that's a really good question. Other countries are allowing it, uh, depending. Not I mean some some other countries like United Kingdom. And they have found that it's both safe and effective. So for instance, in, in UK, they have the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is an adenovirus uh, vector like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And they found that by switching it, it was actually more efficacious in terms of uh, potentially protecting against variants and that kind of thing than uh, simply getting the same brand uh, again. And so there could be some benefit of, of mixing and matching. It's interesting because there's a benefit and a burden for different companies to want to fund those types of, of, uh, of trials. Because if you're Johnson and & Johnson uh, and, and the switch is away from you, you might not want to fund it. You might, you'd be more willing to fund one where it's another Johnson & Johnson booster. And at, however, if it turns out to be bad, so say you're Pfizer and you're trying to get market share away from Johnson & Johnson and show that your booster works in Johnson & Johnson, if you do that clinical trial and something came out poorly, you wouldn't want the bad stigma that you would that you might have gotten from Johnson and Johnson. So there's a risk there without necessarily the reward. And so even funding it could be a little bit tricky. And so um, so I, I don't know. I think these trials are going on, but um, but but it's I don't I don't think there's as much investment in them as as there could be. Um, anyway, here's the another key point that a lot of people are going to be wondering about. The um, date of the VRB pack looking at uh, five to 11 year olds vaccines, that's gonna be October 26th. If that gets approval, then probably within a few days, uh, both the ACIP and, and CDC will, uh, will review and, and, and give it their stamp of approval. Uh, because again, this is, there's such urgency here that they'll go through as fast as they can. Um, and so then uh, as soon as it goes through the CDC, probably within 24 hours, uh, we would see it available on shelves. A lot's going to depend. We, I still don't know yet whether it's going to be um, sep in, uh, separate distribution. Right now, the, there's these vials that are sent out, and at the location of the of the administration of the vaccine of the vaccines, they dilute them uh, to the appropriate dose uh, to 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 give to the patients. The um, ch the child dose 
is a third of the concentration as the adult dose that they're looking at in the five to 11 year olds. And so what that means is they could theoretically just take the existing vials and just dilute them to a lower amount in the uh, pharmacy or wherever the vaccine is administered. And so I don't know yet if that's what they're gonna do. That, that could be what they do, which means within 24 hours, it could be available everywhere. Um, so that's good. All right, uh, Rebecca, next, let's go on to that. Thank I think you, Glenn. That. Yes, very, very helpful. Um, so just jumping back quickly to your slide about flu, and some folks are asking, do we still think it will be a bad flu season? I think we've seen in prior waves because of all of the social distancing and the masking and everything else, flu wasn't as bad, um, but it is starting to spread in the United States. And some are asking, can the flu shot protect against COVID-19? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question that a lot of us are asking. And so, uh, well, there's a few questions there. So I'll go through them uh, pretty quickly. So there are two types of flu that we track, uh, influenza A and influenza B. Uh, you can see back in 2020 before the lockdown, so this was uh, early uh, before the lockdowns, flu was going along, regular flu season, um, and that was in green, light green and dark green. But then when we have the lockdowns, that eliminated flu in addition to a lot of these other uh, circulating pathogens. Um, there was a little bit of a, of a resurgence, tiny, in uh, late July, August of flu of 2020. But then since then, there's been virtually none. And so when you look at it, uh, even to now, so it's currently October, this, this that we're seeing, this light blue here, is actually the uh, metanumovirus uh, rather than the flu. And so the most recent week of data ending October 9th, there is actually 0% at the national level or, or less than 0.0%. There is still a little bit um, of influenza B and influenza A, but there's virtually none. It does vary by state. And so you see that in some states, there's a little tiny bit more, but we're really talking about virtually none here. Um, so the dark green is minimal. The yellow is like very mild, moderate, um, just slightly above low. And then the rest that are all these different shades of green are just various shades of low. So it's still a little bit early, because when you look here at the, um, this, this, what we're looking at here is the number of times that this month was the seasonal peak for flu. So most often the flu peaks in February, but then it has roughly an equal, possible, an equal chance of also peaking in December, January, or March. So it is a little bit early, but you, I'd expect at this point in October, I mean, we're approaching middle of October, that you'd already be seeing a little bit more than we're seeing. But it could just be a late flu season. The interesting thing is that because there has been so little flu throughout the year, um, it's just hard to get flu outbreaks happening. If they do start taking off, I mean, now like I, sh I showed you this, this slide a little earlier, with the kids going back into school, if we start seeing flu starting to spread in addition to COVID or, 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 or uh, if even if COVID doesn't spread as much in some of these states, if we start seeing flu, then it could be something uh, more serious. And so that's why it's, we, there is still this worry uh, that flu could be bad. Part of the worry is that a lot of people who get flu might get it every year or two. And we might not get it bad. We might have very mild flu symptoms or maybe it might even be asymptomatic but it sort of recharges our immune system and keeps our immune system up to, uh, to fighting it. Because if you don't uh, uh, expose yourself to the flu every once in a while, then your body loses the memory, the immune memory of the flu. And so then if you get it five, 10 years later and have not gotten it in between, then it's as if you're getting it for the first time and it's a much more serious disease. And so, or, or if you haven't been vaccinated at all in, in that time, if you lose the immune memory. And so the worry is if a lot of people haven't been vaccinated over the last year and they haven't been infected over the last two years, let's say, then a lot of people might've lost their immune memory. And so it might be more severe uh, flu that hits. And that's why people need to be vaccinated. Um, one thing that's interesting, and this is to the last question that you had, is uh, can the flu shot protect against COVID-19. And it's interesting 
Because most epidemiologists, physicians, virologists, and anyone who looks at this would say no, because the flu shot is specifically for the flu. The COVID is a different virus altogether, totally different mechanisms of action. They should not have anything to do with each other. However, there was a study here that found that people who got, they looked at two different waves, and they found that people who got uh, the flu vaccine uh, were had a 37% reduction in risk for COVID-19 in the first wave and had almost a 50% reduction in COVID-19 in the second wave. So there does seem to be some benefit of the flu vaccine on COVID-19. And the reason is this thing called uh, the induction of trained immunity. And it's this idea that when the vac when the uh, uh, a person is vaccinated with the flu or other things, we talked about this for tuberculosis a year ago, and those clinical trials are still ongoing there with the BCG vaccine about whether a vaccine itself could help to potentiate your immune system, you promote your immune system to better able res to respond to COVID-19. And it seems like there might be something going on here. Um, this was an observational study. And so it could also be that it had nothing to do with the vaccine at all, but just that people who get vaccinated tend to have good behaviors in general uh, that protect, whoops. Oops, all right, I'm getting another call. Let me define this. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. <clears throat> good. So it could just be that, that people who uh, ha exhibit healthy behaviors tend to exhibit all sorts of healthy behaviors and it's those other things that are providing the beneficial effect. However, there's a plausible uh, thing here that they were looking at. So they, they followed this up with a clinical study looking at vaccines. And what they found was that getting the flu vaccine reduced systemic inflammation overall. So this was a beneficial effect, even among people who didn't get the flu. And uh, it increased the likelihood that the immune system responded in beneficial ways to the to, to uh, other types of potential pathogens, not just the flu. Um, and so this was this is interest really interesting. And so it's another really good reason to get vaccinated for the flu. Um, previously, the CDC was suggesting that people wait two weeks after the booster to get the flu vaccine uh, because uh, uh, typically it's uh, what the thinking was was that either the raw materials in the body that are used to create the antibodies might be used up if you get too much at once was the, was the thinking, I think, or that the um, adverse events, that the side effects might be too much if you have both of these things going on at once. And so that's why they suggested waiting two weeks. But since then, they've evaluated this clinically and they realized that it's uh, nothing to worry about and that getting them both done on the same day is just fine. So if people get the booster and get the flu shot on the same day, it's just fine to do that. Um, but so, so this is interesting. I, I don't think that this is evaluated, uh, separating in time the benefit of the flu shot versus uh, reinfection of COVID. Um, but, but I don't know if the, in terms of this, this, healthy, uh, if this healthy extra benefit of getting the flu vaccine, if it actually exists, um, what, how, whether you should get it at the same time as the coup booster shot or, or later, I, I don't know. We, right now, I think there's insufficient uh, evidence to help us to evaluate that. But we'll anyway, take it. we'll take this this bit of good news, right? And even if it shows, it's because people are adopting healthy behaviors, and then we'll take that, right? Absolutely. Can you move on, Glenn, and talk to us about the new Merck drug and tell us a little bit more what we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can find it uh, real quickly. I think it was down here. Merck. All right, so the new Merck drug, it's called uh, mal malnupiravir. Um, and so um, it's an antiviral drug, the way that it works. So typically there's just like four or five ways that antivirals work in general. One is you can prevent a virus. Well, one is you can break, out, break down a virus in the body before it even goes near a cell, but that's very hard to do. So we don't really have very many um, uh, drugs for that. It's not even included here. But then the, another thing you can do is to prevent the virus from binding uh, with the cell and getting in. That's sort of how the monoclonal antibodies work, is that they prevent the, the virus for, by having these artificial antibodies. Uh, they, they can prevent the virus from getting into the cells. Um, what this uh, anti, uh, uh, antiviral does is it interferes with the replication. 
And so what that means is that it essentially um, makes it challenging for the virus after it gets into the cell to, to reproduce and replicate. Um, and so it just it just junks up the, the code. Um, and so that's that's good. It work, it seems to work really well. Interestingly, so so clinical trials always have early stopping rules that are just in case where an independent statistician not involved in the in the trial will get a view of all the data so far. And the reason they need to do this is if something goes horribly wrong and the drug is way worse than you thought, you'd wanna stop the trial much more rapidly in order to, for people not to get uh, more sick. So, so you'd want these early stopping rules. The other reason is that if a drug works really, really well, you'd also wanna stop the, the trial much earlier because then if continuing the trial doesn't give you more information, you already know it works amazingly well, then it's unethical to continue the trial you have to stop the trial and give the drug to everyone because you know it works so well. And so you don't see the latter very often where they where a drug works so well that they stop the trial early. But that's actually what happened here for malnuprevir uh, uh, is that they stopped the trial early because they showed that the drug was working so well. Uh, it seems like it reduces the risk of hospitalization by around 50%, which is, which is uh, similar uh, order of magnitude, not quite as strong uh, as the as the efficacy of the uh, monoclonal antibodies or, or polyclonal antibodies. Definitely, the polyclonal antibodies work a way, work work a lot better uh, than these do. However, the monoclonal antibodies or the polyclonal antibodies cost around two thousand two hundred dollars and require an infusion. They're very hard to get. You have to go to a specific, so like a special hospital or clinic to get these infusions. And it's a real challenge uh, globally in particular to get, and they're really expensive. Um, this drug is an oral drug that you take uh, four capsules twice a day for five days. So 40 pills over the course of the treatment. This, instead of $2,200, this would cost four uh, rather $700. Although the price I think is still uh, being negotiated because it's uh, perceived as being a little bit too high still. Um, and so this, uh, and so that's what we're looking at here. Um, and so this, this is really good news. Uh, right now, it's going to be uh, submitted for uh, emergency use authorization. Um, is there anything else interesting here? Um, and so, right, and, and the, the, it hasn't gone through the process yet. Hopefully it'll be approved very quickly, um, but, but we still, you know how these things take time. So it's probably gonna be at least uh, a matter of weeks before we, we start seeing this. Uh, unlike the, the, the polyclonal uh, antibodies, uh, which you have to go to a clinic and it's they're very hard to get. These, you would need to just go to a regular pharmacy and pick them up. And so it'd be much easier. Unfortunately, the United States has only agreed to purchase so far um, something like one and a half million doses or something, I think I read, that 1.7 million do uh, courses. And so uh, that's probably not enough in a country with 350 million where we're having a lot of people infected. So it's not gonna last a long time. So I don't know uh, what the rules are gonna be. The polyclonal antibodies were given emergency use authorization regardless, to, to, for use on patients, regardless of whether they were previously vaccinated or not. The only issue was whether they were at risk of severe disease. And so it didn't matter. However, because there was a, 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 a limitation in the number of uh, doses available of, the, of these mono, monoclonal antibodies, um, a lot of hospitals, or at least some hospitals, decided on their own that they would not give the doses to people who were um, uh, vaccinated, and they would prioritize people who were unvaccinated, um, because they figured people who were vaccinated had some existing level, level of protection, um, or at least that's what was under discussion in some hospitals I saw in the South. Um, with this, I assume it's going to be like the polyclonal antibodies and we'll hit um, uh, and, and have anyone who's previously been vaccinated or unvaccinated will have access to it. In terms of the way that de the study was designed, let me just pull that up because that that's becomes interesting. Um, so the eligibility requirement, because usually when you get emergency use authorization, it matches pretty closely with what the eligibility, el eligibility criteria were in the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And here the eligibility criteria were anyone with laboratory confirmed mild to moderate COVID-19 uh, 
you had to start on the drug within five days of symptoms. Uh, all patients were required to have at least one risk factor that made it more likely that they would get severe disease if they didn't start on the drug. Um, and that, that those were the only criteria. I don't think that there was any constraint about whether someone was previously um, vaccinated or not. Although I believe that when they started the trial, um, it was already, um, uh, the vaccines hadn't rolled out yet, but I, I don't recall. I see August there, but anyway, so this is good news. We don't have a lot more uh, yet. A lot, yeah, we don't have a lot of information yet, um, but, um, but yeah. Oh, one other thing I can mention here is that this, uh, this drug was also evaluated for people once they became hospitalized. And it found that among people who were hospitalized, it had no effect. And that's the same thing that we found with the polyclonal antibodies, that time is of the essence. And that if you, if you get severe disease and go to the hospital after, because you need to and, and delay the treatment, by the time you get to the hospital, there's no benefit for either taking the polyclonal, ben, uh, polyclonal antibodies or taking this oral drug. So it's the same thing applies. Once people get uh, the, the first symptoms, the sooner they get on the drug, the more efficacy there is for the, for the treatment. Interesting. Well, looks like we have perhaps a few more weeks to wait on this, along with waiting on the kids' um, 5 to 11 vaccine. Yep. Thank you for that deep dive. That was really helpful. So could you tell us where we're, we're at with best practices? How has that evolved and, and where do you see us now as far as indoor gatherings, outdoor gatherings? What do you recommend? Yeah, so here's the thing. This is a, it's a really tricky conversation. Um, originally after the vaccines, you might recall that the CDC said people who were vaccinated could just hang out with other vaccinated people and not wear masks even indoors, and that it wouldn't be a problem. The reason that they ended up switching and requiring masks again was that they found that with the, particularly with the Delta variant, but not just with the Delta variant, that people could still spread the virus and infect other people around them. Um, and so this was one of the major reasons for continuing to wear masks. At some point, and we're, and we're not quite there yet, but at some point, we're gonna probably be like Singapore, where we say, you know, we vaccinated everyone we possibly can, including all the kids we possibly can. Uh, the ones who are choosing not to, that's their choice. I mean, we've already done all the mandates and whatever that we can. Um, and, and so they'll probably open it up. We're, we're not there yet. And so right now, the, the thing to do is for people be, who are outdoors, um, generally, we don't need the masks quite as much if people are, for, are, are standing far enough away. Outdoors is, an, is one of the best things we can do to prevent spread. Um, and so uh, just, just being outdoors with, with fresh air. Um, and so the mask is not nearly as, as necessary among people who are doubly or triply uh, vaccinated. Again, like I, I mentioned earlier, um, the, the key difference between the, the double and triple is the, is the level of antibodies. But, um, oh, and one thing I can bring up in, on, in just a second, I'll talk about the Israel study that adds, uh, some depth here, but but the key thing here is the infection rate versus the severity of disease rate. And so the the even if people are, are infected, the likelihood of a severe disease remains quite low. Unless people are at high risk, um, then if people are, but even if they are at high risk, this we follow these same rules. I think generally, people there's it's always okay to wear a mask. So even outdoors. If someone feels more comfortable wearing a mask, that is totally okay for them to do. Um, it's not necessary for, for many people to do that, but it's totally okay if people want to. For indoor gatherings, the masks are okay. They do provide some benefit. Absolutely they do, but it's not bulletproof. Um, you know that in the real world, people to this day don't wear the perfect mask. Some people are still wearing the cloth masks. They still, sometimes the glasses fog up, which means that there's air exchange and the, and the vaccine is not fitting perfectly, or not the vaccine, the masks are not fitting perfectly well. Um, and so as a result, the masks don't make you bulletproof. Um, and so, so wearing a mask might help a little bit, but the biggest thing for being indoors that helps the most 
is having windows open, having the air circulating, uh, and also the t duration, how much time you spend together. If you're indoors together for 15 minutes, that's very, very different than being indoors together for four hours. And so where you are in terms of how long you're together makes an enormous difference. The masks definitely help, but if you had a choice of masks or opening up all the windows and having a breeze coming through, I would think even maybe the breeze and the air might even be more beneficial. If you had a choice of being together in a room for half an hour versus being together in a room for eight hours, regardless of the mask, being in the room for half an hour is gonna be better. Um, so so they're, they, these are the things to think about. It's all about risk um, modification. And so there's no perfect way here. There's, the risk is always gonna be there, but there's less risk the more things you do. What about the HEPA filtration? What's the thought behind that? Is that still looking like something that is very, very useful? Yeah, absolutely. The more studies that come out on this, the more that we see that the real world data is showing that the filters work very well. Um, we talked in some previous episodes of how to make your own. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to someone uh, just uh, within the last day or two that they were having an event. Uh, and I suggested, well, what if you made this uh, HEPA filter like this and then wrapped it in a glamorous uh, fabric or paper and made it look like it was the same colors and theme as the event you were doing? That would be a really useful way of reducing risk uh, at, 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 uh, indoors because these, these HEPA filters are very uh, inexpensive to make and, can, and, and, are, and work extremely well. Um, but but, there's a, but so, so definitely we've seen consistently that that's the case. All right, I see we have like four minutes left. Let's, we can go a little bit over. There's uh, two or three other things I'd like to discuss. Uh, why don't we discuss the mandates? Cause that was such an interesting question. And then is that okay, Rebecca? That sounds good. Let's go to mandates. All right, so if I can find it, having just said that, um, uh, let's see where that was, here it is. All right, so if you recall back a few months ago, the survey suggested that unvaccinated workers typically were these very vaccine hesitant people. And half of them in many polls, multiple polls suggested half of unvaccinated workers said that they would rather quit than get vaccinated. And so there was this worry that, they, that there would be this mass uh, quitting of people because they didn't want to get vaccinated. But it turns out that across the board, virtually or hardly anyone quit. The most that I saw was it looks like 8% of people vaccinated uh, in New York state um, decided to, to, uh, to, to leave. But even that 92% got vaccinated. I don't know if, if, eight per, if the eight, full 8% uh, actually uh, didn't, uh, if, if they severed their employment. But I know when you look at these other uh, companies, the private companies, like here's uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Ultimately, only 17 of 900 employees chose to leave. So that's only around 2% chose to leave. Even though in Tennessee, the vaccination rate was only 44%, when they made, had this mandate, it only forced 2% to leave, which is, which is virtually nothing. And it's not enough to really impact any of the functioning of, of it. Here's another one. This is uh, Houston, that was Tennessee. Here's Houston uh, Methodist Hospital. They had 25,000 workers um, that were, and they required to get the vaccine. Um, before the mandate, 15% of its employees were unvaccinated. By the time the deadline hit of June 7th, um, only 153 workers were fired or resigned. So that's less than 1% actually left. And so, so in reality, uh, the mandates are working amazingly well and having virtually no, no harmful impact. Uh, these, and these people who are leaving and working in these healthcare facilities are not really the strongest workers, right? If they don't believe in modern medicine, why should they be working in the healthcare system? I mean, it seems kind of silly uh, in a sense, but it's interesting. There's this one article by Paul Krugman, the economist that was interesting of why this is this behavior, what, why we're seeing this behavior. And his theory is that um, the people who were unvaccinated and didn't want to get vaccinated and complained about the mandates, they're, they're mostly complaining because they imagine there to be a personal cost or personal inconvenience 
on behalf of the public good. So they felt like they were required to do something that would mostly help other people and not themselves. And, and regardless of whether that's true or not, that was their thinking. However, when the mandates fell and they would either lose their job or get vaccinated, then their calculus changed and their self-interest reverses. And for them, then make, getting the shots had, was way more important because there were tangible financial costs for not getting the shots. And so that's what the thinking is with these mandates, which is really interesting because this is probably going to impact public health um, interventions in the future in terms of even though we heard a lot of complaining, again, we heard in these polls 50% of people who were unvaccinated saying that they would refuse and they would rather quit their jobs than get vaccinated. It turned out that that was all bluff. And so that's really an interesting finding here. Um, so that's very interesting. Glenn, quick question. Um, Someone in our audience asked, do we still need these pulse oximeters? You had told us a long time ago, make sure you have one of these on hand, but um bump in uh -huh. case you need it. <laughs> do we still, oh, look, it matches mine, your picture. Do we still yep. need to have this? Should we yeah, change the batteries? So, yeah, so, so it actually does make sense to keep it because of some subset of people who are vaccinated are going to get infected. And some subset of those might still develop severe disease. The pulse oximeter is a really easy thing to use every day. So people at high risk of, or severe, of, high risk of severe disease should probably still be testing their blood oxygen levels every day because people might not have any other symptom of being infected, but their blood oxygen level might start to go down a little bit. So it still is a good idea for people over the age of say 65 or 70, or who are otherwise, otherwise at very high risk, it still probably makes sense to test the, um, the blood oxygen once a day for at least the next few months or so, uh, and, or at least while surges are going on. Maybe when there's not a big surge, then it's not something to worry about as much, but while surges are going on and the likelihood of being exposed to COVID-19 without knowing about it, while, while that is relatively high in your geography, then it probably does make sense because it's not easy to get an actual COVID test every day. But one of the first signs that you might have that you've been infected is if your um, blood oxygen falls below 95%, then that would be a reason to go and get the, start, the, the COVID-19 test or to talk to your physician. Um, so, so it still does make sense uh, for people, particularly people who are at high risk. All Great right. advice, Glenn. Rebecca? So, I'm, yeah, I'm why don't you pick one, one or more, two more questions? We're at our near our time together. I have, what about this? Do you want to keep this now or wait for two weeks? Why do we have pandemic waves? Sure, the question, let's, or we can, let's talk about it. All right, let's talk about this. So, um, so the short answer is we don't have a, a perfect answer yet. It's the same thing with the flu seasonality. We don't know the full story here yet, but there's four different things that likely explain why their waves are going on. One is that as waves start to become uh, apparent and this, you, start, you see a surge, people change their behavior and you see changes in policies. So for instance, I mentioned earlier, this is the, this uh, graph of school closings. As you start seeing that there's an outbreak in a school, then if you shut down the school, then whatever surge started to happen from that outbreak where the kids went home, they might've infected their parents and the families, and they might've infected some other people. If you stop the outbreak at the school, then that means that the surge has less juice that's made, that's powering it along. And so it helps the surge to go down. Um, other things, are other changes in behavior, the surges, we saw more people getting vaccinated during the surges. We saw people taking maybe a little bit more care, uh, maybe wearing masks a little bit more uh, and, and, some po and, and different policies going up. So as a result, human behavior changes probably describe a fair amount of it. For me, I think one of the biggest things are these social networks that play a role. And the reason for that is that, say you work, have, work in an office or, you ha, or you're in a family environment, these, these units, uh, once you get infected, then it protects you from getting infected again. So basically uh, it's sort of, once, you, once a surge goes through a certain portion of the population, it's not just random who it hits altogether. It is somewhat random, but not all the way random. 
because it essentially is going through social networks in terms of the spread. And so because of that, the social networks have sort of these barriers in place uh, that sort of prevent spread from going from one social network to the other. Um, however, when in the schools, the schools are one of these natural places where it goes across all social networks because families from all over the place will all have kids in those schools. And so it, will, and so it can sort of bypass regular social networks with regular work environments, regular social environments, et cetera. Um, so, that, so, that, so that sort of breaks it. But so, now, so that'll be interesting to see as we go forward um, over the next couple of months. This is another reason to suggest, well, we'll see if the surges truly subsides that we're looking at or whether it starts to, to stay at the same level for a little while or even starts to go back up again, which is the open question. But the social networks, again, plays this role. Um, seasonality, we've talked about this before as, as, as influencing the pandemics. Um, we have seen, uh, so, so we do know that coronavirus is typically low in a seasonal uh, pattern, similar to flu. Um, these, what we have here is a picture of the cold coronaviruses that like we've mentioned before that there's four common uh, coronaviruses that just cause the common cold. And they typically follow the, a, a very typical um, uh, uh, seasonal variation. When you also look at some of these other viruses that like here's RSV, they also uh, have this very uh, apparent seasonal uh, variation that we're looking at. All right, so the seasonality is, is, the, is another one. The, a couple of other things are that once you um, have start having the surge, then you sort of have these nat this natural immunity that builds up, and then the natural immunity sort of protect is sort of like not necessarily pure herd immunity in the sense that it can fully protect everyone around you, but it could provide some limited protection in local environments, and that can provide just enough help to prevent to prevent the surge from from increasing anymore. And then sometimes there's other factors. Um, so for instance, testing patterns might change and become either stronger or whatnot in terms of uh, helping to prevent the surge and, and, and knowing that it's stopping. There could be less testing, things like humidity, which is also part of the seasonality issue could also be playing factors, but these tend to probably be less important. Um, and, that, and that is that for the pandemic waves. Um, is there any one more question that you wanna ask or should we end it there? There's always so many. Maybe there's there's so always always so many great questions. I think what I'm going to do is suggest that we end it there, and thank you to everybody who has, has sent in so many great questions. Keep sending them in. We really do appreciate, as you see, Glenn puts a lot of time and effort into preparing these conversations. Glenn, we're so grateful, as always, for all that you've done and continue to do. When are we meeting again? That is a good question. Let us see what that looks like. All right, so calendar. So it is currently the 10th. I guess we're meeting October 24th in two weeks. Is that okay for you, Rebecca? Sounds good. So okay, mark your calendars two sometime. weeks from today. 7 Everyone can 7 p.m. Eastern time. Continue to stay safe, be well, and we look forward to being back together then. Thanks, everyone. Have a great two weeks.